All right, pleased to welcome in Ben Golliver. He covers the NBA for the Washington. Air in the NBA bubble, Ben Golliver. How would you? Lifetime type of opportunity. I lived in Disney World for 90. From couldn't leave for any reason except. Except to get a COVID test. I mean, it was a very. were pre-packaged. We had a little pen that we kind of couldn't lead. It was uh, less than a mile around uh, the outside of it. And uh, we were on sh chartered sh shuttle buses getting to games back and forth, uh, you know, day after day after day. And, and no ability to drive or, or leave the campus for any reason. Officers and security guards kept us there. So it was a very unique but also fulfilling experience because the basketball was played at a very high level. And it was just such a quirky thing. You know, a, a guy as famous as LeBron James goes to Disney World to win his fourth title. That just felt like something I needed to write a book about. I, I laughed uh, when you said 93 days, 92 nights. I like how it was that right. specific. You know what I mean? Where it's, it's almost like you're itching to get out of there with, with good reason. Is that how you felt at the end? Oh, believe me, everybody was counting down. I did my very best to kind of stave off the senioritis feelings because I really wanted to lock in and enjoy the NBA finals, but it was hilarious. You'll remember those finals. Jimmy Butler just wouldn't give up. And so every time the Heat kept winning a game, uh, people kept coming back on the media shuttle bus saying, oh, no, we got to be here for two more days, three more days. Like Jimmy Butler was like the ultimate spoiler of the whole thing. I actually booked my flights home after game two of the NBA finals, because I thought, look, there's no way Miami's coming back. They've got all these injuries. It's going to be a sweep. So I had to change my flight out of there uh, multiple times. So certainly there was a, you know, an interest and an itch to uh, get back to something closer to normal life. Uh, but at the same time, I think the people who were there are going to look back on it fondly. I think people, the, the writers anyways, almost feel like alumni of this, you know, weird club that uh, everybody had to go through together, the swamp like conditions, walking around this, ghost town amusement park with you know really no other tourists anywhere in sight just very very different playing games at high school gyms you know i had more uh you know people watching me play when i was in sixth grade playing aau for the beaverton running beavers out there in the portland area than lebron had during the nba finals so think about that that's how weird it was wow that is wild what's um what's something that happened on the court because of the circumstances that you will always remember because of how it looked and how it felt? Well, I would say from a local angle, it would be Damian Lillard and the trash talk with the LA Clippers. I mean, you'll remember he missed two clutch free throws and the Clippers bench was just really going over the top, kind of mocking him, whether it was Patrick Beverly and, and some of their other players laughing. And after the game, they're kind of waving Lillard off the court. And he was just seething in the aftermath of that post-game press conference. Now, he always keeps a very level head, but you can tell he was upset. He felt disrespected by those guys. And these press conference rooms that we used at that point were very small. It almost felt like, a, you know, a, you know, somebody's like work from home office, you know, I mean, very just kind of confined, uh, you know, space. So you could just feel everyone's energy and we could really feel Damian Lillard's energy. He let off on those guys. Of course, they went back and forth trading barbs on Instagram, but the unique aspect of that trash talk was everybody in the gym could hear it because it's an empty gym. So this wasn't like a typical game at Staples Center where, yeah, everybody's yelling, fans are yelling. Oh, if you miss a couple free throws, everybody's cheering and it, it becomes this whole scene. It was really just like Patrick Beverly's voice carrying through the entire building. And, you know, a lot of people kind of get a little bit uncomfortable, like how is Damian going to respond? So, you know, certainly he got the last lap with the next week of, of games and how well he played in the aftermath of that. I mean, they made the mistake of poking the bear, but I'll never forget those kind of trash talk exchanges. And we heard a few of those over the course of the three months. If you go power rankings of trash talk, who would be some of the guys that are in the top three? Well, I would say the Lakers came with a real purpose to be the loudest team and to kind of like try to intimidate everybody else. I mean, their bench had the, their favorite thing, and it was probably because the food wasn't great at Disney World. So every time Anthony Davis would get the ball against a smaller player, they would just start shouting out types of food. You know, it's like barbecue chicken, steak. I mean, because he was going to be eating up the defender was kind of their idea, but they would come up with these crazy different food options, um, almost like they had been to the all-you-can-eat buffet or something, uh, you know, getting a little bit creative with it. Um, you know, during the second round of the playoffs, 
against Houston, uh, Lakers forward LeBron James was basically telling uh, Robert Coven to stop whining, stop looking to the officials for help. They were just getting beat fair and square. And, you know, there was a, a lot of moments like that. They didn't go out of their way necessarily to humiliate anyone. And certainly they didn't go as far as that Clippers team did in that situation I mentioned earlier. But they felt like they were sort of the kings of the bubble, that they had the best team, that they were going to win. And ultimately they did go in 16 and 5 through the playoffs to claim the title. And I do think they were trying to keep that psychological uh, psychological edge. He's Ben Golliver, covers the NBA for the Washington Post. One more on this, the author of Bubble Ball Inside the NBA's Fight to Save a Season. It's been writing has been compared to pregnancy and childbirth. <laughs> you told me this before the interview started. I hadn't heard that, but as someone who went through the entire process, more so the swings, right? The emotional swings than like literally being right. pregnant. How would you describe the process of writing this book? Well, first I would defer all, you know, questions about that to uh, the, the wonderful women in your audience. Absolutely. And I'm sure my mom would say, oh, it was probably a lot harder giving birth to me, you know, than it was for me to write this book. But it was a challenge. There's no question. You know, when I left the bubble in October, I took one week off and I was kind of thinking, well, the NBA schedule, we're probably not going to get back into a season for, you know, until January or February. And it turns out they did the accelerated off season. So that really crunched the amount of time I had to dig in and write this book. And so for me, the, the focus was write it while the memories are still fresh, uh, write it while it's kind of like on front of mind. And make sure you're writing this for history, too. Make sure that basketball fans 15, 20 years from now, um, you know, if they're trying to say, how did LeBron win a title in Disney World? Why did the NBA do this? What happened during the pandemic? How much money was at stake? I mean, I, I wanted to make sure I told all those stories because it's a basketball story, but it's also a public health story, a business story, um, you know, and uh, I think there's a social justice story as well with the amount of protest that the players were um, holding throughout last summer as well. And I wanted to capture all of those layers while it was still fresh and, you know, kind of right in that same time period where we were running into the presidential election, which obviously hung over the season as well. So, um, you know, it was it was grueling. I'll say that. But I'm so excited to have it out here next week. And I can't wait to hear what people think. I'm just curious, what was the toughest part of storytelling, editing? What would you say it was? Well, it's just, you know, mostly trying to get all these memories down. You know, I look at my contemporaneous accounts, right? So I had hundreds of tweets that I, you know, put out there while I was there. I had dozens of stories that I wrote, dozens of interviews that I conducted. I had uh, hundreds of hours of video footage from various press conferences and interviews. Um, you know, I had, uh, you know, thousands of photos. And we actually do include some of my photos in the book, which is cool. And so it's about taking all of that source material and boiling it down into a story where you can enjoy it if you love basketball or more if you're a casual basketball fan. And, it, you know, it's more about capturing that feel of Disney World. To me, that was the entire idea. You know, people kind of compared it to a sci-fi movie. You know, I'm being sent down there into this bubble-like atmosphere where, you know, we're even wearing tracking monitors that if we get too close to other people, they start to beep like smoke detectors. I wanted to make sure that those details and memories um, came through so that if, you know, somebody had been watching it on television, they would get the full behind the scenes experience uh, from someone who was there. Um, I could talk to you about this all day. I swear I'll get to 2021 in a second, but this bubble thing I find fascinating. I can't remember exactly what it was. Was it Westbrook's brother who got tossed for talking trash? I, did that happen at all with some of the fans there talking oh, yeah. to the players? No, that happened right in front of me, too. I mean, another good example of the, of the trash talking that would go on. So there was a code of conduct policy for family members and friends. You were not supposed to do anything, right, where you're just kind of supposed to like, hey, if your guy does something good, great, you know, don't heckle. And uh, Rondo, uh, yeah, sure the players would look sharp for television. It was the end of the series. He had played very poorly, and Rondo's. Ultimately, like Westbrook turned to the referees, knowing the rules about fan conduct and was like, Get and sure enough, they took Rondo's brother right out of the arena. Of course, you know, Houston, their season was bad, but yeah, it got pretty tense in some of those moments, but that was for wives, girlfriends, and children who, you know, they kind of had that same vibe I described earlier. They were just hoping to get home as soon as possible. That's awesome, man. Okay, Ben Golliver, if we look at the NBA right now, 
this play-in tournament. Where do you stand on it? Are you a fan? Or are you not? Well, coming into the season, I thought this could be, you know, a weird incentive, right? You're boiling the entire season down for what? Two games potentially after 72 that you're forcing these teams to play. And we heard the Dallas Mavericks, Luka Doncic and Mark Cuban kind of air those types of concerns earlier this year. But when you're watching it play out, they're having a lot of success with it. It's building in some real drama to the bottom of the Eastern Conference. You know, the Washington Wizards are able to go on to a run and uh, potentially just inject some more energy into that part of the bracket. You're seeing Golden State get so much more attention here over the last couple of weeks because Steph Curry's played amazing basketball uh, and because it really has implications in terms of lifting them into that playoff picture. And you're seeing really interesting races, you know, five, six between the, the Lakers and the, the Mavericks. And I'm um, even in the Eastern Conference, it's really, really tight. We don't know who's going to play whom. So I think that ultimately it makes the entire playoff forecasting process more difficult for the prognosticators. We can't predict it as well. But that's probably more fun for the fans and more engaging. And so when I'm looking forward to next year, I actually think at this point they're going to keep this thing. I think they're going to bring it back and um, use it as a way to just kind of prevent some of the dog days feelings that we usually get later in the NBA season because it's a long season. And I, and I think they want to try to keep as many fan bases as invested as possible as they kind of go forward and, and welcome people back into buildings after the pandemic. You look at the standings, the Blazers are a game out of sixth place which obviously is a big deal to get if you look beyond that the the Blazers could potentially in the first round face the Suns they could face the Clippers do you look at one being a better matchup than the other for the Blazers well I think unfortunately for Portland they're the team that everybody wants to play right now because they don't play any defense and their their spirit has not been great and so either they can turn this thing around in the next couple of weeks or they're going to be the, the team that everyone's got circled and, and really wants to face them. You would rather play Phoenix than the Clippers. I think from a matchup perspective, I mean, Lillard and, and Chris Paul in their backcourt is a better matchup for Portland than trying to deal with the Clippers' big wings. I think the Clippers have the number one offense since the All-Star break. That's a real recipe for disaster if you're Blazers or, or the Blazers fans. And, you know, guys like Kawhi Leonard and uh, Paul George – the Blazers just don't have the, the defensive forces to keep up with those guys individually. So I, I think for sure, Portland, your preference is to play uh, the Suns if you can. But look, they've been on a slide here. Um, those standings could easily change the wrong way, and, and they've got to figure it out, I think. Otherwise, there could be some changes coming this offseason. Where do you um, – let's stick with that, with the Blazers. Uh, do you anticipate major changes in the offseason? Well, it's tricky when you've got the big salaries, you know, to actually blow things up or to retool is difficult just from a salary cap standpoint. But I think, um, you know, there's going to be questions about Terry Stotts if there's a step back this year. In other words, if they're not competitive in the first round of the playoffs or if they get knocked in the play in, I could easily see some discussion there about, OK, well, what does uh, his next step look like? Is it time for a new voice? We see a lot of teams impatient with their coaches here after uh, after the bubble is a great example of a number of coaches, uh, you know, teams changed coaches, whether it was the Clippers, the Sixers, the Pelicans. And so I would be watching that for sure. The only real way that they can, uh, you know, radically change the roster would be to trade CJ McCollum that I can see. And there's been a real reluctance to do that. But I think that, you know, at some point you're going to look in the mirror and ask yourself, is this formula working? And to me, it just really hasn't been working here for the last couple of months. And I'm not sure how they're going to be able to turn it around in time. Do you, if you start walking down that road, are there a few potential names on a list in a trade for C.J. McCollum that you could see benefiting the Blazers? Well, here's the tough part about it right now. A lot of the best players in the league have re-signed extensions around the league recently because of a response to the pandemic, in my opinion. In other words, they want to solidify their spots, right? A lot of these teams are out there saying, Let's just hold tight until we get through this thing. So you saw LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Giannis, a number of the biggest stars do that. And what that makes is for a trickier trade market because you don't have as many teams motivated to make deals. And I think that, you know, you obviously, if you're going to trade CJ, you want to do it when his value is the highest. And there's a lot of respect for his game around the league. Um, you know, I wouldn't say anything's imminent necessarily or they're, they're going to be locked is still working is this who we want to keep being or you know he's going to age like fine wine because of that jump shot is it time to try to reimagine uh you know a different 
think a lot of this boils down, though, to ownership's commitment. Right now, it's really expensive to keep up with the Joe. You see the number of draft picks teams like Brooklyn had to give up to go get a James Harden or Milwaukee had to give up to give a, a Drew Holiday. Trying to compete in the short term is very, very expensive. It's expensive from a draft pick standpoint. And so I think if you're Portland, it, it's about goals. Are you still trying to be in that mix or are you okay with being a second or third tier team in the Western Conference? And, you know, if Paul Allen was the owner, I'd say, well, you know, he's probably trying to go for it. I mean, this is a passion project for his entire life. Um, I think it's a different ownership situation right now. By the way, I have to know, food wise, what was the best and what was the worst meal you had in the bubble? Well, I got a pizza after I was there for like six weeks in. It was probably my first pizza in three months. So that was easily the best. I mean, that was like rediscovering something. I don't know. People like, you know, give stuff up for Lent. That's kind of what it felt like. (laughs) The worst is easy. You know, I used to send out these text messages to kind of mess with people. Um, We got a vegetarian meatloaf. So just imagine a brick that's brown with brown sauce all over it. And it's coming in like this prepackaged little box. I mean, it looked horrible. I would send that to all my friends. They would send me back the puke emoji text. And, you know, that would be kind of like my ongoing joke. Someone had a bad take. I just sent him a picture of that veggie meatloaf to let him know what I thought about it, you know? So um, that was clearly the the loser in the clubhouse for sure. But, you know, look, I, I, all things considered, I can't complain. I mean, I did put on weight when I was in the bubble, actually, because the stress of the playoffs and working so much. So the food couldn't have been that bad. And they had a couple good veggie burgers. And obviously a Caesar salad was nice. And after we were there for about half the time, they opened up a room service menu, which was a uh, you know a complete game changer. Because when we first got there, it was just a lot of uh, prepackaged foods, like I said, where you're just struggling to even get your calories. By the way, real fast, what would be a, I don't know, like a mainstream opinion or something close to that right now that you disagree with and you would give the veggie meatloaf, you know, picture? <laughs> Well, that's a that's a tough question. I mean, I think that there was a big reaction after Jamal Murray went down that like, oh, the Nuggets are completely out of it, right? Natural reaction for sure. I just say don't count out playoff Jokic, right? He's going to get a tough matchup against the Lakers, which is the worst matchup, uh, you know, pretty much possible for them. That one's not locked in, but it looks like it's headed that way. So I could easily see Denver losing in the first round. But this idea that he's going to go out quietly, um, you know, that's nonsense to me. And I also think there's a budding... Uh, You know, in the Eastern Conference, there's a budding momentum for Tom Thibodeau as coach of the year. And to me, it should still be Quinn Snyder. You know, I think that you get a lot of attention when you're in the big market. You turn things around. The defense is so much better from this year to last year. And so, you know, Thibodeau should be a strong candidate. But I look at Quinn Snyder. Nobody saw them coming in as the best team in the league, best point differential in the league, top five offense, top five defense, rock solid the whole way through. And and making that jump from good to great is so difficult. I would try to reward him. I also like the fact he's never going to ask for the attention. And so it's kind of incumbent upon media guys like me who respect their consistency to say, hey, wait a minute. Let's uh, let's give Quinn Snyder some props because he's done a great job there in Utah. Interesting. Well, hey, man, great stuff. Good chatting with you today, Ben. I hope you have a great day and hopefully uh, we can interact again sometime soon. But good luck with the book. And thanks for sharing your thoughts on that as well. Well, thanks for having me very much. I appreciate it, and take care. I wish the best to you and your family. All right, thank you very much. There he is, Ben Golliver, covers the NBA for the Washington Post, and again, author of Bubble Ball, Inside the NBA's Fight to Save a Season.